Thank you all for coming uh, to this session, defending the defenders, uh, the right to protect the environment. Uh, it's a very important session, nice to see a little crowd. I guess the environmental crisis is perhaps the defining crisis of our time. And um, often the destruction of the environment passes in silence because the environment can't speak, so we rely on brave defenders of the environment to tell us what is happening. And so I'm honored to be joined on stage today by three very brave defenders from three different continents. So if we could warmly welcome them. <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> oh, <it's not> <laughs> so I'll, I'll quickly introduce them and we'll get talking. And about halfway or half an hour in, I'll open up for questions. So please think of questions. We'd love to have an interactive session if possible and uh, you know, have, have a, a lively discussion uh, as much as we can. So uh, I'll begin with uh, Monica Lopez Baltonado, is an uh, environmental activist and a human rights lawyer from Nicaragua. And she's the author of a book, uh, Handing Over a Country, Legal Implications of uh, Maritime Canal mm -hmm. in Nicaragua that uh, President Ortega is trying to build. Then we have John Unzima, who is a Ugandan journalist, freelance journalist with the New Vision newspaper, and also an environmental activist working in the northwest of Uganda with Friends of Zoka, uh, mostly working on issues of illegal logging. And we have Alex Gonzalez Davidson, a Spanish environmental activist uh, working in Cambodia, founded a very important uh, environmental defense organization there called Mother Nature that has been persecuted and harassed by the Hun Sen regime. And, um, and yeah, and we're gonna, talk, we're gonna speak broadly about uh, the work that they do, uh, the challenges that they face, both purely in terms of bringing to light this environmental crisis, but also from authoritarian states uh, that they work in and the implications of trying to defend the environment in, in these repressive um, political spaces. And so perhaps I can begin with you, Monica. Uh, could you tell us, you've been working on this maritime canal and uh, you've been trying to oppose it. Could you tell us what's at stake here? Be uh, is, is it just, is, is it the usual conflict, you know, uh, the government's trying to build an, uh, an economic project that will bring money to communities and communities are trying to defend their land or are they trying to defend a way of life? What is at stake here? Why is it so heated, this conflict? Well, thank you, and I'm very happy to be sharing the conversation with you. Uh, it's my first time in this uh, Oslo Freedom Forum, and I'm like really amazed about the size and the scope and the people that are here. So uh, I'm, I appreciate very much the opportunity to share uh, struggles in Nicaragua, not only environmental struggles, but human rights struggles. And uh, the starting point for me would be um, the intense fight a Nicaraguan population have been having against this mega project uh, that it's building up a water mm -hmm. canal mm -hmm. that would be kind of twice the size of the Panama Canal, but not only that, like a bunch of mega projects associated to that. So this uh, concession to build up all of these projects was given by the current regime in power, uh, which is led by a couple. A this is basically a family dictatorship. Uh, Daniel Ortega and Rosario Murillo are currently president and vice president in Nicaragua, and they are a couple. And they gave up this concession to a Chinese private investor. Mm -hmm. And we found out about all of this mega project uh, nine years ago. Uh, they spent several years <coughs> negotiating it in secret. And then we found out once the law to approve this was in parliament and approved in 24 hours. Of course, this is a parliament that is controlled by the regime. And what the project and the concession implies is that this uh, investor has rights over the main uh, wow. resources and land in Nicaragua for 100 years. And this include also affecting the main water resource of all Central America, which is Nicaragua's big lake, Lake Cosibolca. Yeah. And of course, it would affect uh, indigenous people's land, local communities, rural communities, and more than six protected areas. So it yeah. was 
immense the and, impact. And, and they didn't have much of a say, I'm guessing, in, in any of this process. It was exactly. all in secret. No, no, yeah, it was completely <coughs> negotiated in secret, approved, uh, as I mentioned, by a parliament that didn't even wait to have an environmental impact assessment report. There was no sort of uh, consultation, not even with the indigenous communities that, as we know, have the right to be consulted. So it was approved nine years ago that way, and that gave birth to what I consider to be the most important social movement in Nicaragua for mm -hmm. the past, I think, 30 years, which is the campesinos movement, which have been led by campesinos as rural uh, communities. Yeah. And they have led more than 100 protests in Nicaragua against uh, the canal. And I would have to say that also, uh, interestingly, triggered a, a massive rebellion in Nicaragua that happened in 2018. And do you think it's going to go ahead, or what's your sense? Um, I think the starting point uh, went very wrong for the regime because so many people along the areas that were going to be affected started massively protesting against it. Uh, it was very good that environmentalists joined efforts with rural communities, uh, Afro-descendants and indigenous peoples leader. And I think at the beginning uh, it was massive protests that stopped the project from moving forward. Okay. But then uh, the failure, financial failure of the, this Chinese private investor joined our efforts. And the end, uh, the 2018, 2018 protests, massive protests claiming that uh, Ortega Murillo stepped out of power in Nicaragua and, and the level of repression that triggered also helped, out, helped us out that until now, nine years have passed and they have not been able to build any of the mega projects that they were uh, thinking of building. It was a complete political failure for the regime, but unfortunately the law is still there yeah. and the regime is still in power. So the consequences of it, we, we are still worried we might see them in the future. So the struggle st still is alive. And, yeah. Yeah. John, maybe moving from Central America to now East Africa, you work in Northwest Uganda in a community that is, has a lot of uh, primal forest and also uh, serves as a, as a route for exports of logs, of charcoal, of gold, of lots of resources. Tell us about your struggle in your work, uh, your journalism work and your activism work in, in that part of Uganda. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Just like Monica says, it's my first time here speaking at Oslo Freedom Forum, and I, I think it's, a, it's nice that we are sharing this, and I'm learning that uh, we have similar challenges, just like my, my panelists here. Yes, I come from northern, northwestern Uganda, the extreme northwestern. We are 30 minutes away drive to, into South Sudan. <coughs> my region borders three countries, Democratic Republic of Congo, towards the southern, and then South Sudan. So these are, these are big, countries, you know, the story of Congo and resources, and then the story of South Sudan and resources. Yeah. Then now, Uganda plays, at the moment, Uganda is the center of transit of these <coughs> natural resources. For instance, Uganda does not produce, there's no fissile production of gold as such. Gold is produced at artisanal level. Yes. But then, it, it's, it's, one of the, it's one of the exits of gold the biggest exit of actual gold in the East Africa. It's one of the biggest exporters of gold, right? Exactly, yeah, in East yeah. Africa, so yes. Not much mining. So, yes. So, so that gives a picture of, of really the question of natural resources. From 2016, I and colleagues started uh, picked interest because my town has a, has a forest, a central forest called Zoka Central Forest. We, because when we were young, we grew up there and we see this forest, we got a lot of, from, from the forest. This is the identity of the local Madi people who live there. But then we started noticing illegal activities of lumbering, logging, and, and encroachment, and charcoal business in it. And then we started, as a journalist, I, I was assigned to go and do a day's story, just write about it, and then see what the activists are doing. Then I, I encountered an activist who happens to be my friend. But then that very day, I could appreciate and see that the problem is bigger than the one we thought would come and cover and leave. So we found people employed by the state, military, and police, guarding the people who are doing the illegal destructions. And then since 2016, it has become really my journalism, has become now environmental journalism. So 
for those of you who have not known much about Uganda, Uganda is, a, is, a, is, a, is, is, is one of these countries, I think that has the, the longest sitting president in the world now, if I'm not, because he's been there since 1986. I was not there when he became president. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it, it reaches a point that he looks at the country like his own property, so he, he does whatever he wants with the resources of the country. And um, towards the road of defending the forest in my town, we discovered that actually his brother is, is involved. Yeah. It is a public knowledge that the president's brother is the one cutting the central forest. Yeah. To central forests are the ones that are supposed to be managed <coughs> by the central government on behalf of the community. Uh -huh. This is what the law says in Uganda, that forest, central forests are managed by the government on behalf of the people. So then the, then you have community forests, yes. This is on community land. Like I can plant my forest on my own land. Okay. Um, the most unfortunate bit, of, unfortunate bit here is that uh, now the one we gave to the government is the one going. So, so the, this, one, the government's supposed to protect those forests, exactly. but they're the ones destroying it. Yeah, it's the one going, and the one at community, community land is not going. So we started raising this question. And in 2020, May, we made startling discovery that this is really a network of not simple people. Because we, we tracked, we tracked <laughs> this where these things are going. We came out to the border with Kenya. These products go as far as Middle East. But then we... To the Middle East? Yes, okay. the Middle East. And perhaps, I don't know, even here in Europe, maybe some, some sure. of the products are here. Yeah. I, I can't tell. Because yeah. you said, I, I, I remember you were telling me that it's very precious wood that is exported, right? It's, it's wood used for furniture and high quality, what's it, red wood, rosewood. Exactly, before we go to the high-end products, these, these forests are the identity of the people. Mm -hmm. the, the, the culture of the Mali people rotates around a tree. Everything we do in our life every day as Mali people, it, it rotates around a tree. We, we mingle our food using tree. Actually, we, we, we don't eat meat as much as that. We eat leaves, we live on nuts. We, this is the tradition of the people. That's how important the forest is. But then, now, <coughs> definitely, the, the person who's coming to cut the forest has seen something in it, yep. and he's taking it for the products you've mentioned. Right. Yes. Just to say that, uh, why I brought the context of Congo and South Sudan is that when we, we made more discoveries, we realized that uh, actually our region is, 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 a, is, a, is in the wider target of the, is part of the wider target of the people who are depleting these forest resources. Um, we went to the border with South Sudan, where I was arrested in May 2020 on gunpoint with, uh, by Ugandan soldiers who are supposed to be protecting these resources. And then South Sudanese um, outfit, a rebel outfit in South Sudan, they, they call themselves SPLM in opposition. They are guarding a log deposit, a forest product deposit illegally. And the orders, guess where the orders to arrest us is coming from? It's coming from the resident district commissioner of the, that district called Moyo District. So it's like, it's an official, but then illegal business. So if you speak about it, like the way I'm doing now, you, you, you start getting a sense of feeling that you are challenging the politics of the day. Yeah. So eventually you realize you are being labeled as a, as a of course it, it gives a negative connotation to the people who sympathize with this, long, this regime that has stayed long in power, yeah. that you're opposing mm -hmm. what you want to do, you're opposing our good deeds to the people, you are, you are, you are a regressive voice. But actually, this is really the progressive voice. And this is protecting the livelihood of the people. Sure. Yeah. So it's so, really a conflict between one way of seeing the forest, which is your identity yes. for your community, the Friends of Zoka, and then the, there's an economic sort of group that sees the forest in another way, in, in financial terms, in, for exports, and, the, and you, you find yourself up against quite a formidable network. Exactly, there's a cartel, there's a big <coughs> network yeah. of that cartel behind the state. They use the state. To yeah. be precise, they use the state to advance their interests. And you know the state has all the apparatus, the police, the army, and everything. They, they have the powers to change the law. In 2017, they smuggled, um, they intended to smuggle a bill in the parliament to degazate the central forest, I'm talking about Zoka Central Forest, for planting sugar cane until we, 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 we decided to organize a community event to talk against it. Unfortunately for us, even our local leaders joined, and that voice in a kind help. But I would like to tell you that that plan is still there, because the idea is that the, the forest goes, and when the forest goes, 
the plant, they replace it with sugarcane, and then they, 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 they are into the aspect of the, the capitalism and, and, and making money out of it. But this is not the, this is not the person from that region. Yes, this, this is somebody from somewhere we don't see. It's very powerful. The contest is between the, the most vulnerable person who, whose life rotates around this forest and this force that you don't see, that wants the forest to go and want, wanting to take the land. Because after the forest is gone, it is the land. Yeah. When they own the land, then finally the, the local community is, is left. Or no, I mean, they, there will be nothing to survive about. And then even politically, you become less, less powerful because you cannot speak. This is a question of taking away what you have to, making you, to, to make you powerless, to make you have no voice. And it's happening. I grew up there, we used to get a lot of rain. This is mid year almost, we are going to June. We get only three rain, heavy rain, only three. By this time, we should be growing a lot of food, but this, the past three years, it's not the case. So the local person is already becoming less powerful. Yes. You take away what they have, More then hungry. you... Yes, yeah, yeah. something yeah, of yeah. that sort. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Alex, now moving to <coughs> Southeast Asia. You work in Cambodia, but you, you can't stay there, and you can't live there anymore. You're based in Thailand, like Monica, who's now based in Costa Rica, and I guess John is still based in Uganda. Um, but tell us a little bit about Mother Nature's fight. It's mostly been in sand mining for construction, for cement, and also hydroelectric dams built by the Chinese. And tell us what it's been like to try and what the impact of these projects has been first. Well, first, I will say <clears throat> I don't really speak English in public, so I apologize. <laughs> I only speak in Khmer, which is a language of Cambodia, so I apologize in advance. And secondly, I was born in Spain. My father is Spanish. My mother is from England, but I am a Cambodian in my heart. Uh -huh. I lived there for 13 years, and um, I was never given nationality. I was given a deportation order, several... Uh, <laughs> 15 years jail time and now blacklisted, I cannot return. And I'm here today representing the many, many brave Cambodian people, Absolutely. mostly quite young. You've met a few of them. Yes, I, when I moved to Cambodia, I lived in Cambodia for a few years. Two months after I moved there, I heard about Alex, about this European man who spoke excellent Khmer, <laughs> who, got, who was forced to leave, who was asked to leave because of the brave work that he had done. Yeah, Cambodia, yeah. Cambodia is a dictatorship which they like foreigners who go there to give them, I don't know, to, to do the job of the government, but they don't like foreigners who go there and tell the truth on Facebook, YouTube. So I'm here representing Cambodian people. Hopefully they will come here in the future, not me. I can be sitting there, they can be the ones talking, but right now, the Cambodian dictatorship will not allow it. You know, they would be arrested when they go back to Cambodia. Um, I started as an environmental activist. Uh, we did campaigns on sand mining, export to Singapore. Singapore imported at least 80 million tons of Cambodian sand to make the country bigger. And Cambodia lost mangroves. Cambodia lost a lot, uh, some of its own country. If you've been to Singapore and you've seen those artificial trees, you know, the, this part San, with... Santosa Island. Yes, and, and there are these, it's surreal. There's artificial trees built of cement, and the cement is built using sand from Cambodia, so they've destroyed mangrove and primary forest to build an artificial forest forest with cement trees and with lights, and, you know, it, it's, it's completely next time, surreal. Next time anybody, anybody goes to Singapore and you fly to the airport, you should stick a Cambodian flag <laughs> on the airport. This is our country. <laughs> 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 it's it's sand from Sing from uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and now from Myanmar, Vietnam, and Cambodia. So the campaign we did, many people. I was deported. Uh, three of my friends were in jail for a long time, but we we forced the Singaporean government to stop the import of Cambodian sand. We did campaigns on uh, fake hydroelectric dams, not real hydroelectric dams, mostly for rosewood. So not only Uganda, uh -huh. Cambodia used to have a lot of rosewood. Because they're trying to clear the forest to build that catchment zone. Up. Well, they, they will have a, like the family of Hun Sen. Hun Sen is the name of the dictator who has been in power longer. So Hun Sen is number one now. He's 1985. <laughs> World record. <laughs> we have a competition. He's asked, his family will own the, the, the company which has the right to clear the future reservoir of, an, of a, 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 a hydroelectric dam, which will never produce electricity. So they will basically buy all rosewood from the whole national park and say it came from the reservoir. Right. 
and the government makes very little. The people in the government will make money, but not the government, not the state. So we did campaigns on that. We, we actually stopped the hydroelectric dam, which was quite impressive. Again, many people went to jail. And now, over the last two years, I was telling you last night, I've realized that unless Cambodia changes from dictatorship to uh, democracy, we will not really achieve much in terms of environmental stuff. So when people ask me, what do you do? I don't, I don't longer say I'm an environmental activist. Now I say I am an anti-dictatorship activist. And it's true, you know. Uh, and the government of Cambodia, well, the dictatorship, they don't like it when I say that. But, you know, that's uh, the reality. And, and the last thing I will say is that there's a lot of hope in Cambodia. I think Thailand too. Myanmar too. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't know a lot about Myanmar, but Thailand, where I live now, Cambodia, there's a whole new generation of people who are like, we don't want this anymore. We want to be in a normal country. It doesn't have to be a perfect democracy or a, or a booming economy, but we want freedom, we want true democracy. And this is what really gives me hope, even though there's a lot of repression. The Chinese Communist Party is completely contro controlling the Hun Sen regime. Uh, Hun Sen is the ex-Khmer Rouge. They can be really violent. Khmer Rouge genocide, 1975. Right. But despite all this, we are you know, full of hope. I am 100% sure that Cambodia will become a democracy. And I am 100% sure that not just Cambodia, but the whole region will transform even Laos, which is extremely repressive. Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, Cambodia, Thailand will become something similar to Eastern Europe 30 years ago or to Latin America during the 1980s. You know, it will happen. So I'm here to meet people. I'm here to learn new ideas so that we can implement them and Hun Sen can, we can force Hun Sen to retire to play golf in Dubai or in, <laughs> in Hanoi him, yeah, or in Beijing. Thank you. Yeah, give him an easy out, right? One-way ticket, no return. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting what you're saying. You're saying that the environmental conflict and this, uh, the fight to protect the environment is actually better served in a broader battle to defend democracy and to a fight against authoritarianism. There's a saying that we use in the Cambodian environmental movement is that what we have been doing for a few years is we are cleaning up, cleaning up the, the scat, the scat of the elephant. Can I say a, a swear word? The shit, <laughs> right? The elephant is shitting in the forest and we are cleaning up the shit. So we basically, we will continue doing this forever. What we need to do is chase the elephant out, uh -huh. meaning chase Hun Sen regime out non-violently, even though they will always be violent. Yep. And then hopefully after that, they can, we, we can return to our environmental activism, reintroducing tigers. No more tigers in Cambodia, completely gone. No more leopards. From hunting and... Poaching, military. Habitat, yes. You know, it's always people at the elite. Restore the Mekong River, which is being destroyed by hydroelectric dams, sun mining, and restore the environment and go back and, 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 and enjoy the beautiful nature. Yeah. You brought up the violence... Maybe we can go on the group, but we could begin with you. What, what kind of violence have you faced in trying to defend you know, these, these forests, the land, the environment? The only, only, one of the good things about the Hun Sen regime, there's a lot of things uh, violently, sorry, there's a lot of things they cannot do so easily. It's difficult for them to shoot you. Yes, they can shoot you or torture you, but there's a reaction that, ne that was not there 10 years ago. I have a a good friend of mine, Chut Bhutthi, he was an environmental yes, activist. Yes, yes. He was murdered in his car 10 years ago. And the reaction was really big. So the good thing is that it's really difficult for the, the Cambodian regime to kill you. So what they do now is they jail you for incitement, plotting, anything really. You know, uh, Court cases, that kind of thing. Court cases. I mean, in my case, they, they, they issue an arrest warrant and all these court uh, summons. And then they don't give me a visa. But of course, all my colleagues they do get uh, a visa because they're already inside the country. So most of the violence is like being jailed in very, very uh, overcrowded and unhealthy conditions. I used to work in jails before with the International Red Cross. I was a translator. And Cambodian jails can really break your spirit. So that's the violence. Even though nobody calls it violence, it is violence. They will stop you from getting a job uh, in the private sector. They will pressure your family. They will threaten you over the phone. They will threaten your school. Healthcare. Well, healthcare. Nobody in Cambodia gets healthcare. <laughs> Our healthcare is in Thailand. You know, we have to go to Thailand to pay. You know, so uh, it really is like a systematic. But I think that's a good sign. I think the Cambodian regime is really scared. 
you know, everybody in Cambodia is scared because they live in a dictatorship, but nobody is more scared than Hun Sen. We are now doing cartoons, we, we draw Hun Sen, and we mock him, uh -huh. and you see the reaction of him, he's really scared you know, of a cartoon. So I think that's, it's a good sign. You know, that's, a, that's a level of violence is decreasing, but at the same time, it's still very much there, and it's, in a way, affecting even more people than before. Uh -huh. Monica, how is it in Central America, in Nicaragua? What made you, what forced you to flee to Costa Rica? And yeah, what, how, how are you trying to you know, fight this battle from abroad now? Yeah, um, I, I would like to start f uh, by the maybe positive angle, which is that uh, it was amazing to live and be, be part of a process where environmental struggles were part of triggering the consciousness of a society to understand we were living under a dictatorship and we needed to uh, achieve a change in the regime. And the social movement against this interoceanic canal concession, but not only that, the fact that in 2018 there was a, a tremendous fire happening in a protected area in Nicaragua, and that triggered students who many people thought were not looking at the political aspects of their life to mobilize. And, and that in the end triggered, I would, I, I would call it a national liberation movement that it's happening in Nicaragua by non-violent means, which is completely, uh, historically speaking, something new for us in Central America. Uh, we've lived several dictatorships. We've lived several uh, dictatorships that were faced by guerrillas, armed groups. Ortega, looking Ortega was part of, he was a hero at one point, right? I wouldn't call him a hero, but he was part of the process. That's huh. true. He was part of the, of the process against a previous dictatorship we had for 45 years in Nicaragua. And at the moment, I think uh, how the environmental struggles helped out uh, younger generations to engage, it's a very positive up outcome. But I want to jo uh, join uh, uh, Alex's reflection on the fact that at the moment, it's quite evident in Nicaragua that we won't be able to stop the destruction that is happening uh, in terms of all the resources, natural resources in Nicaragua, uh, through mining concessions, all of the things that the regime is doing, if we don't achieve a political change. Uh, there is an enormous desire to do it by nonviolent means, but the fact is really the violence, to go to your question, that it's coming out of the regime, uh, I, I would have to be very honest to say uh, we never thought in our darkest dream we would leave this level of violence. In 2018, uh, the regime started publicly killing any kind of people in the streets that were protesting with their white and blue flags. Uh, more than 350 people were formally documented that were shot by snipers, by police officers, openly in the streets while students were live streaming. This completely shocked, shocked everyone and more protests started happening. And I would have to say that maybe more than 2,000 people have been illegally detained in Nicaragua. At the moment, we have more than 100, 180 political prisoners which are under the most horrendous conditions. And I want to acknowledge here the presence of one of the families of the political prisoners, Berta, uh, spoke here, I think, last year. Uh, she's in the room, and I want to acknowledge uh, the claim that we are doing in any place we can that these 180 people uh, are released. Uh, and when I say torture conditions, I mean they don't have even access to read a book, to have a pen and paper, they are mo many of them in isolated cells. Uh, they don't have uh, the possibility even to talk to their kids or to their relatives that are outside. Uh, so it's completely uh, terrific what they're doing. They're trying to, to basically kill them alive by not uh, providing them health services in, in jail. So we need to make this, uh, take this forum uh, to make this claim. And, and, and also to, to help out, uh, because we know that Nicaragua is a small country in Central America, six million people, and every time we hear what's happening worldwide, sometimes you feel, well, how can you call up the attention of a small uh, country like ours? But the reality is that, as many speakers have been saying, 
Uh, if the Nicaraguan situation doesn't uh, resolve positively soon, Central America will once again uh, uh, find uh, um, in this impossible pathway of how to overcome a dictatorship with this level of uh, repression without using uh, violent means. And we were supposed to have had 40 years ago some peace agreements to change situations in, in, in Central America, and, and that's really a failure of really all the region. It's not a failure only of, of uh, Nicaraguan politics. So it's very important for us that you are aware that we are under a family <laughs> dictatorship regime and, and to call on your support to, to help us with the release of the political prisoners at the moment. And the level of violence speaks yeah. to the level of fear in the government and how the environmental battle is not just for the land and natural resources. It's the regimes at least see it as a broader political battle for, you know, to, to unseat them and take away their power. So before we open up for questions, I'll just come to John, who two days before, a few days before coming here, faced a personal threat yourself, and it wasn't clear if you would make it out of your community, if you would get to Kampala to catch your flight here. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about this incident to you know, indicate the kind of threats and violence that you face in your reporting. Yeah, uh, yeah just like, I, because I boarded my flight on, uh, on uh, Wednesday, I think, Today's when, or, I mean, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Today's Monday. on Friday, yeah. yes, on Friday, sorry. And the day before, my colleague William was supposed to be here. He was here last year, I mean, the other year, about the last Oslo Freedom Forum, he came around. He was supposed to come, but then I thought I would not come here because the day I was supposed to come, William was stopped at the airport from coming here. So as we talk, I don't know where he is, but when I talked to him in the morning, he got the um, National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders in Uganda. They are keeping him. Um, the, the violence, if you speak to it, it's really big to say. Um, in, on the New Year's Eve, coming to, coming to this year, we received a WhatsApp. We have a WhatsApp group for the activists and journalists defending environment. So we, this WhatsApp group was apparently directed to me. And it is, in it, the conversation is uh, between a regional office of the prime minister official, then a local journalist who also became now a politician. And this, this voice note was said by the deputy prime minister of Uganda, who happens to be the member of parliament of one of the districts of my region there. He's also a general in the army. So, in the WhatsApp group, the discussion is that, the audio is that uh, I, should, I should be dealt with in the Museveni way. That so they, they said that they should deal with, with you in, in the Museveni, Museveni way. way. Because, what does that mean? Yeah, it means, the, of course, Museveni is the president, and the state under Museveni has been operating like, uh, like when they, they dangle the carrot, they give the carrot to you, but if you don't take it, yeah. they definitely eliminate you. So in this case, the carrot was a job they offered you? Yes, they will offer you a job. My district was offering a job of, of uh, information person, the communication person of the district, to me, three times. <laughs> I turned it down. They sent my former teacher to come to me, to talk me into this job. I turned it down. Then later we got this WhatsApp, WhatsApp voice note that now I need to be dealt with them in any way. So it's a... I had to run around the country because there were no opportunities of leaving the country as such. Because if so, they offer you the job, then they buy you in a way. They control what you say. Yes, they control. And they've done it to so many activists and journalists in Uganda, popular journalists, in Ugandan journalists who have been respected previously, are now the ones organizing the birthday of the first son. They are the cheerleaders of the first son who is preparing to become the next president of the country, according to what, what we see happening in the country. So they will buy you, you keep quiet, or they deal with you or they curtail your freedom of movement, just like they have done to William, who was stopped at Entebbe Airport, coming here. Um, the incident of being arrested, and you know, in 1983, my, my parents met, and they were, they were students of a medical school. So my parents, they, they finished medical school, and they, they are saving people's life. So in 2020, I got myself with gun on my head from the army who's paid by a soldier who's, who's paid by the taxpayers' money of my country. 
and he's complaining about me saying this thing is bad, you're destroying the environment. It, it sends a very deep, um, what should I say, a very deep pain into one. You know that really this gun, you purchase it with your taxpayer's money. This gun is supposed to be, if it's useful anyway, it's supposed to be used to protect what the country is having. But this gun is used to take away what the country has, right? Yeah. So, a lot of things. In 2017, I was beaten in front of police, just, just like this police were watching. It was just a stage set. There was a riot protest in town. I went to cover just as a journalist, and then I was roughed up. Later, when we followed, it was a properly orchestrated by the police, so to see. On my case, on the WhatsApp voice note, when I tried to report to the nearest police station in my town, they turned me down. They cannot record my statement. They say I am not supposed to record my statement there. I had to come to police headquarters in Kampala. They recorded the statement, but as I speak now, nothing came out of that. Nobody's being summoned to come and answer. Why are you sending this message to this person? I mean, it's a... It's, it's when it's a, this feeling that where justice meets a dead end, you know, it meets a dead end and nothing happens. So for all the things that have been happening, my colleague William many times has been accused of stealing charcoal, you know, because the, because the community rises up and impounds trucks because of the work we do. But then they will say, the police will, will, will write a statement and say it is the activists who've stolen charcoal. But then at the end of the day, it's the police who takes the charcoal and something like that. So trumped up charges. Things that do not exist is, is brought up against you. There have been house break-ins, um, of course, blackmail. You are being blackmailed. My sister had to, had to leave the town. My, my, my sister is, is, is now somewhere in Uganda, but then had to leave my town because I, the least I can afford is for people to know her that she's my sister. People, local people have known her, but a bit distant people don't know. And so she's safer. A, a, a bit now. safer, yes. Yeah. My girlfriend cannot understand why I cannot openly move with her like that because it, it, it's not, it's not real easy. Personal, yes. Yeah, it's real yeah, because effects. something will happen. Yeah. They, there's a way they want to put pain in you and if they cannot reach you, definitely they will reach people someone close closer to you. To you. Yeah. And social life is not there for people like me. Where you, don't go, you don't go to the public park to see it. You, you have to be conscious of what you do. You have to always check the security detail of your actions, you know, what will happen next, because you are, nobody's controlling you. But, but I mean, nobody's after you. I mean, nobody's uh, taking care of you. You have to take care of yourself. This is a, a situation where now we live in. We, we watch our shadows even with a lot of care. Yes, we, we managed to, yes, we managed to, to, through the work, we managed to change a few things. There's a small critical mass that is growing. The last election, local politicians lost election mainly because of the question of the forest and natural resources. The people are seeing it, but the force to see it is a little bit uh, watered down by the powerful force that is coming to counter the, 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 the efforts, yeah. Maybe we can open, yes, a question here and then, yes, go ahead, please. Perfect. So we're, everyone's around, so we're around for the next three days, obviously. I'm not sure we're going to get to all these questions in full detail, <laughs> but feel free to reach out and uh, maybe we... So the questions were, international support, do you get enough support? And I think that's relevant also here. There are technologists, there are journalists, there are people who can give you visibility, tools. What do you need? Are you getting enough support? Um, we talked a little bit about the you know, democracy versus political versus environment, you know, how they're together and, you know, how they're separate. Can, can your work become safer? You know, can we make the cost uh, lower for people like yourselves? And corporations versus governments, do they use different tactics? Do you, have you seen any difference in the way they operate? Maybe we can just, a couple of minutes each. Yeah? Let's yeah. start the other go? way around. Okay. <laughs> in answer to the first question, um, I don't think um, support from United Nations or European Union is, is there. If you're in Cambodia and you go to jail, there are grants for your family to go and visit you. I mean, it's not enough, but I don't think that the biggest gap is not in international support, at least in Cambodia. The biggest gap lies in the inability of Cambodian activists, politicians, syndicate leaders, pro-democracy activists to unite 
it's really difficult. And I think that's because you are yeah. living in a dictatorship for so long who has taught you to be paranoid of everybody else, distrust everybody yeah. else. Yeah. This uh, intelligence, well, intelligence community has infiltrated. They're not intelligent, but they call themselves that. <laughs> they infiltrate all the groups, and they make you think, oh, who is this person? Is he a spy? So it's really hard to like get support from fellow Cambodians. And the other thing that we really would like to see is more uh, assistance or more support among Southeast Asian people, like I said before, you know, Thai activists, Cambodian activists. Because I think if you, if you think too global, Sometimes it's too abstract, you know, Cambodian people, they support Nicaragua, they support Uganda, but it's far different language, the culture is completely different. But if you talk in Cambodia about Hong Kong activists, they're like, they could really identify with that. But the level of support between Hong Kong, Thailand, Cambodia is, at least in Cambodia, is really low. So I think that would be, my top preference would be less attention by international, no, no, not less, same attention by international, because <laughs> if you lose it, it's, it's really bad, right? Yeah. But the, to try and make it more inside Cambodia and regionally amongst the same people who are fighting for democracy. Thanks. Very insightful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You want me to go first? No, no. Go ahead. I'll, I'll All right. I, I, I think uh, the, the question whether we, 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 we get the support, we, uh, this is what I see from the grassroots, what I see happening in my community and which I, I think should be a bit questioned and also because, because the, the, the regimes we are talking about have their own narratives. They come with different narratives on global platforms. And, and this puts them in a picture of, uh, of, adv of advantage. They give them more advantage than the voices that the activists or the journalists are trying to put up. For instance, I'll give you an example. Uganda is credited as a model refugee host country, right? My region, my, my region alone hosts over... 500,000 South Sudanese refugees, which is positive. Who is hosting these refugees? It's not, if you go to the, to the grassroots, it's not, it's not the, the government hosting the refugees, in my view. It's the people who have the goodwill to live with other people hosting it, because it's, this, this idea is just being used as a tool to give the government a good face outside, but then inside something wrong is happening. So the, the, the global community needs to start questioning some of the support being given to these regimes. And I think if these this, this supports are put into, into, in a way that will give you this, but, and then you have to do this, will be better, because if you support them, and then the voices of the, the activists are not reaching out, definitely they will continue to perpetuate what they are doing. And what me, me I'll, at this platform, what I will just ask for is that uh, I think working at the regional level is okay, but then also globally, the need to question the support rendered on the other. Because somebody asked a question about politics and activism, this is it. These two are not distinct from what, I am, from what we are doing. You cannot separate the two. In Uganda, we have a public management law. It's called Public Management Act. It came up about four years ago. And the law says, for you to gather, you must get uh, permission, or you must get notification from police. Now, they don't define what gathering, which gathering they don't, they don't define. So they selectively apply. Yes, yeah. which literally means that even in your family, when you call for a family function, they can literally come and say, close it, go home. It's, 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 not, it's not allowed. So your intention, your good intention to do something right is definitely turned political by the power that be. Yeah. See? So it's, it's really difficult to, to separate, but of course, the, the need for networking, the need to grow grassroots journalism, local journalism, very critical. Local journalism needs to be grown to tell this story, to go far, where, where I, the environment I operate, the media is not developed as in other places. Just before he came here, he was telling me, John, Uganda is not in the news. Yes, Uganda is not in the news, but a lot is happening. And it's until the big events happen, it's until Uganda goes to election, that's when you start seeing Uganda in the news. It's until, and, and literally government chooses what to go in the news, if they choose that the refugees are arriving, let's get the big press there to tell the story, they will take it there. But then they will never tell you the story of the, of the things happening. My town currently is going to be connected by a 66-kilometer road being upgraded, upgraded with money from European Union. 54 million euros is going to be upgraded. But then the first thing that starts moving away from this town on this road 
it, it, it's the forest products and the logs. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, I think this money needs to be questioned and say, okay, well, I'm, we are giving you the money to do the road, but then what are you taking away from the people from on this exactly. road? Exactly. Because at the end of the day, the government is going to use the same road for, saying, for telling people, you see, you need to vote me again because we have done the road, but then you are taking the resources away. So this is the, the kind of complex interplay we see in this thing. Certainly networking is needed. The need to grow and empower local journalism to tell this story mm -hmm. is very, very important. We should not wait for the, the, the big media from elsewhere to come and tell the story, but the, the network of grassroots journalists who, have already, who are already in the system of telling this story needs to be empowered and to tell the story the more. There are few who have the guts, who have the energy to stand there and, and feel the heat. We say that if you don't want to take the smoke, just leave the kitchen. And this is the narrative that family members tell us, please, you are wasting a lot of time inside there. You just leave it. You just leave it. It's not going to help you. That's it. Um, I wanted to, to, to reply to the question of the international community because um, I was listening to uh, Thor, who is the CEO of the Human Rights Foundation, saying how this is a forum right about discussing authoritarian regimes. But I do think we need to discuss the role of democracies in what's happening in countries like ours. Um, Nicaragua, uh, for many, many years, we have been denouncing the crimes that were being committed against indigenous people's leaders, uh, the crimes that were being committed against uh, environmentalists, and it was until the bloodshed was so open and so massive and so evident that the international community started reacting properly to the situation. And Nicaragua has been assigned a geopolitical role historically from the perspective of the northern countries, which is the United States. And the role they have assigned to, to our country and the region is okay, if the regime or government in power, if it's stopping migration, mm -hmm from reaching yes. us, if it's stopping drugs from reaching us, and if they are working well with free trade agreements, that's okay. And for many years, this regime was undermining all the democratic institutions in Nicaragua, was selectively killing and violating human rights. And nobody was reacting properly to that deterioration. And democracies have a responsibility. It cannot be the standard until the bloodshed. It's so evident in the streets that we start worrying about it. And, and I'm very sad to say that what happened in Nicaragua could have been prevented if a stronger reaction to all the different step I by know. step, how they were destroying everything. And there were Nicaraguan voices strongly saying from civil society, this is going to lead to a dictatorship. And it was very hard to convince the international community. So I, I, I do think forums like this need to discuss the level of responsibility uh, in, in, in what implies how these dictatorships uh, evolved. And, and, and finally, I would, I would like to say also that uh, unfortunately, Latin America is the deadliest continent for environmental uh, activists. Uh, Colombia, it's terrible. Honduras is terrible. I don't know if with the current uh, situation uh, in the continent, we will be able to make uh, environmentalist activist, activism safer. Uh, for me personally, and, and I would like to share just close with this, uh, I was very uh, shocked uh, by the killing of Berta Cáceres, a person that I respect a lot, an environmental activist internationally recognized. Uh, I saw her just a few months before she was killed. And I think it's a very difficult decision for an environmental activist to decide if you are putting your own life at risk. Uh, that's the reason why I, uh, in two times, I decided to exile. Uh, the first time, one year, and just recently, 10 months ago, I decided to, to leave the, the country again. Uh, my purpose is to keep working on this, uh, but uh, in the end, I decided uh, I, I didn't want the regime to have uh, the power over my body if they uh, get me, because I have a long uh, profile of, of, of in, in their view, uh, not positive. <laughs> so, so, but this is a very personal decision, very difficult decision, and you have to respect 
uh, any decision that it's done in this sense. But unfortunately, I don't see that environmental activism or even human rights activism in general becoming safer, at least not, not in Nicaragua and, and not in Latin America to, to talk about the broader context. Yeah. Well, thank you. We're out of time. But thank you so much for all of your important contributions. And thank you for the questions. And yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I just like to say, if you see this flag, it's backwards it, because it's a protest symbol for Nicaraguan people. Are more than 200,000 Nicaraguan people requesting asylum worldwide. And my call to this forum is support refugees requesting from any part of the world, any place. It's very important because it's the only way we can recharge batteries to come back to our countries and keep the struggle. So, thank you.